freedom of movement for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh was always restricted. However, in September of 2019, the Bangladesh authorities decided to drastically reduce this further. The government announced plans to fence off large parts of the camps, separating the host communities from Rohingya refugees and increasing the level of restrictions on movement between camps. The fence construction started uh, very soon after the decision and was led by the army and overseen by the Ministry of Disaster Management and Relief and the Ministry of Defense. By January of this year, the authorities had completed nearly 80% of the project to erect uh, 142 kilometers of fencing around the refugee camps in Cox's Bazar district. They hope to complete in June of this year. The length of 140 kilometers, as you can see, which uh, completed by January of this year, already exceeds the total perimeter of both the Ukia and Tekna sites. If the original idea was to fence the perimeters, then it would have been 120 kilometers. But the fact that the actual length already exceeds the length of the two perimeters gives us an idea of what the authorities have been doing. They are both building a fence around the perimeter and within the perimeter, thereby restricting movement between the camps. And this has had disastrous consequences, especially in the fire that happened on March the 22nd. Even before the fire, there were very many negative developments around the fence. One year ago, 700 facilities, I repeat, 700 facilities designated for refugees fell outside the boundary of the fence. That was in March of 2020. So the fence was not even recognizing camp demarcations set up by RRC, by the, uh, the Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner. Thousands of families, Rohingya families, according to army estimates up to 5,000, had to be relocated. And many Bangladeshis also found themselves within the fencing. So there was upheaval and disruption for both Rohingya and their Bangladeshi neighbors. Let me quickly come to the impact of barbed wire fencing before the fire. Barbed wire affected people's daily routines in every way you can think of. Going to a clinic or hospital became problematic for the infirm or disabled because they had to walk long distances. Women have told me that during their pregnancy, walking to the clinic became difficult because of the distance to the gate. Simple everyday things like going to the market for essentials took much longer. As I've already said, people have had to uh, demolish their homes and rebuild it elsewhere. In some cases, shops as well. Visiting someone in another camp suddenly became an uncertain thing. Gates might be open or they might not be. Entry gates became a problem because of the guards. They became settings for arbitrary mobile phone checks, beatings and extortion. Children cut themselves on the wire, on the razor wire, because you can see it's not just uh, barbed wire that's going on, but there's razor wire as well, the concertina razor wire and their play areas were cut off from them. The fence affected livelihoods as many could not now go to seek informal employment. I've also documented stories where people have been unable to get timely treatment because of the distances involved. And in one case, a child reportedly died. In short, refugee life was disrupted in every way possible. Of course, there was never any dialogue before the construction of the fence. There was no dialogue with the Rohingya. There was no accountability to donors and partners in the camps. The installation took no cognizance of what would make services accessible or less accessible. 
the actual boundary lines that were followed by the fencing were not based on any recognition of what might what people might need or what would reduce future vulnerabilities. One of the biggest vulnerabilities which the authorities missed is fire. This is a big one to miss because according to the Intersector Coordination Group, there have been 84 fires in four months. On March 22nd, just under a month ago, the largest fire ever in the camps destroyed large areas of Camp 8 and Camp 9. It affected more than 50,000 people. People died, children went missing, people lost all their possessions, whatever little they had. What we observed is during, uh, that during, these, uh, during the fire, refugees tried to smash the barbed wire pillars or make openings to escape. In this image, you can see to, to your left that people are trying to get through uh, the barbed wire uh, to escape with their belongings, whatever they could carry. Old people were dragged through small openings, lacerating their bodies. People lost their children. One woman that, I, that we interviewed found her two toddler-aged daughters only after four days. So you can imagine the pain and the trauma. Refugees came forward afterwards and stated in no uncertain terms that their escape from the fire was prevented and impeded by barbed wire. Several international and local NGOs came forward also. They issued a very clear statement. The fencing hampered the ability of refugees to escape and cause significant delays to fire services. I'm quoting, by the way. The delays contributed to greater damage to the homes, learning centers, and health facilities upon which the refugees rely, particularly in one camp where everything was destroyed. Uh, very established organizations made that assessment. Save the Children, Action Aid, Christian Aid, Danish Refugee Council, World Vision, VSO, Islamic Relief, and others. This is all very different from what Home Minister Asaduzzaman Khan Kamal said. Only in January of this year, he said, they are refugees. They must live within the camps. They cannot go out. The government is building the barbed wire fencing around the camps so that Rohingya can stay inside the camps with safety and security. His words, safety and security. I think the only thing that we can safely say is that there is no safety or security provided by barbed wire fencing at all. It prevented and impeded escape from a horrific fire. I've seen many horrific images from the fire. I'm not going to share them with you. I will, however, like to show you this one. I have deliberately blurred it, but it is distressing. And uh, so I, if you want to look away, you should do so. This is Abdullah, an eight-year-old boy who was trying to enter into a latrine to save himself. He couldn't. He was burned alive. But the image that sticks in my mind is this man. This man is the father of Abdullah. When we asked him, if he needed any help, this is what he told us. I think it shows his great resilience and his great love for his child. He said, and I'm quoting, many NGOs tried to get in touch with me. I didn't contact them. A Muslim NGO visited me, offered to support me. 
I told them they could support me in the same way they're supporting others. I didn't want anything more than what they were doing for others. I told them, even if you give me everything in this world, my son will not come back to me. <laughs> 